by a very, very special guest, the mayor of Oakland, the Honorable Libby Schaff. Libby, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Taj. And thanks for holding this super important conversation. Nothing is more important right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, Mayor, during this unprecedented time of COVID-19, this pandemic, which has changed everything that we've all known to exist in our, in our daily lives and our society. So we thank you for taking a moment to talk with us about a very important topic that has also plagued our country you know, for hundreds of years, and that's really discussing race. And the A's have been generous enough to give myself a platform to lead a series of conversations that you were joining to really start a dialogue that as a professional sports organization, you know, race is, is a very sensitive topic and a very prominent topic. And we have taken the, the opportunity to use our platform to have a dialogue, which to our, to our knowledge, Mayor, not any other sports team in any other sport thus far has taken the stance of doing on a regular basis of using their platforms to continue the dialogue on a sustainable level to talk about the importance of race in the communities of which they serve and, and play. So thank you again for joining us and let's just jump right in. I think some of the things that we really wanna dive into are just getting to know you and knowing you as a person before we start talking about all these heavy topics. Um, you've been mayor for a while in Oakland and you're a pretty well-known mayor nationally due to some of the things you have, you have st stood up for in our community and we appreciate you for doing that. But tell us a little bit about you and you're an Oaklander, you're born and raised here. Give us some of your background. Yeah, born and raised in Oakland. I've always been so in love with my city and it's because Oakland's not just a place for me. Oakland has always stood for values. And first and foremost is the value of having an inclusive, diverse city. Uh, growing up, you know, I, I knew that I was super blessed. And, and as I started to go outside of Oakland, I really realized how blessed I was to live in this diversity. Uh, whether that was uh, because of different perspectives that I could get from having friends that, that were different than I was or had different backgrounds, whether it was the food, the music, the culture, the energy, uh, I always found that as a blessing. Uh, I graduated from Skyline High School, go Titans, in cl okay. class of 83. Uh, and, and, you know, at a time when Oakland was having racial tensions while I was growing up. But, you know, I think everyone has their journey of discovering race and its impacts differently. And I really do want to commend the A's because sports is one of those places where we come together and see ourselves as part of a singular family. Uh, and obviously our sports figures, our heroes, uh, as we certainly have seen with Colin Kaepernick, uh, are in a unique position to lead, to take risks, to speak out about injustice, but to also be a bridge, particularly among the different generations and different communities that make up the city that you so beautifully represent. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, give us a little bit more insight into your, into your earlier years, you know, growing up in the community. What were some of the experiences you remember of Oakland you know, during your upbringing, during your childhood. And I'll give you an example. When I was coming up, we had this awesome event called Festival at the Lake. And, you know, it was the coming together of our entire community. And in years past, I mean, that's become art and soul and, and other things that the city has embraced. But a lot of people miss Festival at the Lake, Mayor. And I'm wondering, what were your experiences of that event if you attended back in the day and other things that you may have done, Fairyland, just things that represented our community from years past and some of your experiences that you, you can recall growing up. Well, um, I was a character in Children's Fairyland starting when I was nine years old. I played Cinderella uh, for a year and then I played Raggedy Ann. In fact, I still have a picture in my full-on Cinderella costume, although not the ball gown, the, the 
cinders right. and you know the rat the ratty cinderella <laughs> um, <laughs> riding on charlie o charlie o then yeah. <laughs> the oakland a's mascot right. the donkey charlie o um, and and again it, it was part of what taught me my my pride in oakland uh, we were ambassadors. We would travel outside of Oakland to, you know, county fairs and, and perform different places. And again, Fairyland was this representation of, of Oakland young people and that diversity, that energy. Um, now, Festival at the Lake, uh, I didn't just attend Festival at the Lake. Festival at the Lake was a thing for me <laughs> growing up. My mom was the original volunteer coordinator for the very first festival at the lake. Wow. And you better believe I was one of her first volunteers. That's and great. I eventually actually got a paid job. I was the uh, assistant director of operations for the festival. Wow. And that's part of when I talk about just my, my burning passion for our city and how we come together uh, in our diversity. And it's not just something that is a fact about our city, it is a celebration. Um, I think about Festival at the Lake. I think about, you know, the fry, the, the fry bread uh, booth. And, right. and it was there that I, about the, you know, uh, the International Friendship House, Tribal International Friendship House. I learned that Oakland was an urban relocation center for Native Americans from throughout the country. I actually learned that through my Festival at the Lake experience. Uh, I saw the Purple Bamboo Orchestra, which was out of Lincoln Elementary School. Elementary school children playing traditional Chinese opera, but their lead singer was an African-American child singing yeah. perfect Mandarin, like only in Oakland. And so Festival at the Lake, um, I think, really embodied for some of us who grew up with that tradition, this, this proud celebration of our diversity and doing it in a way um, that was so special for Oakland. I think Lake Merritt is another just oh so Oakland thing, how we kind of take beautiful nature and what is a wildlife preserve, the oldest and first in the country, but we plop it down in the middle of our city. And it's a place where we feel like no matter who you are, Lake Merritt is your living room. And it's where Oakland's family comes to hang out with each other. Absolutely, Mayor. Well, I appreciate the, those remarks. And as you know, Lake Merritt is so important to our community. A lot of people wanna see Festival at the Lake return because of all the things that have happened at the lake over the last few years, You know, from the barbecue Becky incident to all of the things taking place now. That could be something that could really bring the city together, do you think? I do, although I think in some ways, like we have a little festival at the lake going on just about every weekend. Although, uh, like we've got to put a pause on that during COVID. Um, it, it is making me very nervous. I've been very big about give the lake a break. But whether it's the barbecue side of the lake or the new amphitheater at the end of the lake, that that wasn't there when we grew up. Remember, it was just a big concrete wall and it smelled funky on that end of the lake, let's be honest. And now it's this beautiful amphitheater. You know, we had, uh, sorry to talk about another team, but we celebrated the Warriors, you know, championship victory. Let's do that for the A's. Come on, there you go. we can do this. But I've, I've gone to weddings there. I've gone to exercise classes there. I've gone to protests there. Like it's all happening because we've really invested in our lake and we've made it a place for community to come together. And, and I, I feel like it's a mini festival at the lake every weekend. There is Lake Fest, which is a great new event that really is, uh, I think, kind of embodying the heart and soul of what festival was. But this is part of, of that race conversation and it's the joyous part. So right. let us do more of that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for touching on that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about COVID since you mentioned it. What can we do in our community to be responsible right now, you know, during this pandemic, be supportive of businesses, local small businesses that are trying to survive, industry, et cetera. What are your words to our audience on maintaining their social distancing, but also being as active as we can be, right, under the current constraints to make sure our community economically, 
continues to thrive and we can support each other in those ways that are safe and healthy? Well, first of all, if you are blessed enough to be earning a paycheck right now, please use it and spend it more generously than you ever would. And whether that is, you know, paying for services that you're not using right now because of COVID, uh, or it's investing a lot in gift certificates or online purchases. Be thoughtful before you click on that Amazon site. Think about ordering your things from local stores. Um, we have got to support our own local community. Uh, and we did get the great news today that uh, outdoor dining at least is gonna continue with all the proper approvals uh, in Alameda County. I know people expect stability and predictability from government, right. but that is not the moment we're in right now. This virus is not predictable. It is not stable. And while we are waiting for a cure and a vaccine, we have to follow doctor's orders. And it's hard, everyone is tired, but we have got to stop the family and friend gatherings. We know that that's a big driver in the increases that we've seen. Um, but let me, let me tie into the race conversation because COVID has everything to do with race. Right. Uh, we knew as soon as this pandemic hit, we did not need to wait for the actual data to come out to know that COVID was going to hit our most vulnerable communities first and worst. You know, we've seen double the mortality rate in the African-American community. But we knew that was going to happen because we have such higher rates of diabetes and heart and lung disease in that community. We didn't need to wait to see that there were going to be disparities in different parts of the city based on who's having to work outside the home right now or doesn't have health insurance coverage, doesn't have the type of job that allows them to telecommute safely from home. Uh, we knew that we would see these disparities, and uh, it is atrocious. You know, the, the 94601 zip code, which is heavily Latino in the Fruitvale, has, you know, 14 times the infection rate of 94618 in Rockridge. Right. And so race does matter in COVID. And we are trying very hard to bring, you know, free testing facilities into those neighborhoods to set up those facilities so that they are accessible and feel safe for all our community, including our undocumented workers. But it is really important that everybody recognize that these racial disparities harm us all. Absolutely. This is not the kind of city that we wanna have. And so when we look at the policy changes that have to come out of this moment, the lessons that we have to learn. Uh, I am really pushing for things like universal health care coverage. You should not have to have a job to have health care coverage. Pushing for a guaranteed income. Uh, I was a founding member under the leadership of Stockton Mayor, Mayor Tubbs, um, to really advance this idea at the federal level that everyone should have a guaranteed basic income. We're seeing the benefits just with the increase in unemployment insurance. What a difference that is making, especially in a high cost city like Oakland. These are the kinds of policies that are needed to start to undo racial disparities that are absolutely the legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow, of the genocide of our Native Americans, and of xenophobic immigration rules that are, are broken. Absolutely. So I, I hope we do not waste this moment. I think there is an appetite for policy changes that are far more dramatic than government usually is comfortable with. So, you know, rise up Oakland. I know that, you know, this is a city that, that has always been about social justice. Right. So let us uh, take advantage of the moment. Well, let, thank you for that, Mayor. Well, let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper on that. So in terms of communities of color that are being disproportionately impacted by COVID and just all of the things we're talking about, what are some of the resources that our viewers can go to, websites, helpful, helpful things that we can know about in terms of getting more information, finding testing locations, 
things of that nature, services that are available with the city and or county that you can share with our, our viewers? Sure. Um, there is a lot of information on Alameda County's website. Um, you know, the city loves to think that the, the world revolves around us, but public health, social services, those are all in the county's kind of purview. So if you go to acgov.org, AC as in Alameda County, gov.org, you can get a map of all the free testing sites in Oakland, a map of where you can pick up free groceries, uh, find out about free meal delivery. We, we are delivering meals to the homes of our seniors and disabled residents so they don't have to go out uh, and expose themselves. Uh, in Oakland, you can uh, look it up. Our website is oaklandca.gov and slash food or slash testing. You can find out more about the specific resources in Oakland. And if you don't have easy access to a computer, 211. 211 is the one stop information referral phone number for all of Alameda County that can connect you to, again, food support, uh, if you need shelter, if you need uh, free testing, uh, they can take care of all those things. So, really important resources to know about. Thank you for giving us that information. And on this note, you know, there are so many different aspects to what's taking place right now. And some of these issues are pre-existing, right? We have a pre-existing affordability issue. We have a pre-existing homelessness issue. How have you and your administration, as well as the city council, been working in concert to think about the changes to policies that you had alluded to a moment ago on what we can do, not only during COVID, but post-COVID, what changes do you see forthcoming in legislation and how do you work in partnership with your colleagues in the city council to find solutions to things that have been ongoing issues, but now more so than ever, we are in dire need of, of those solutions to come to fruition. So what, what can we expect from your administration, Mayor, in, in the months to come? Sure, and the city council um, just has been a great partner I will say that um, I keep challenging the organization to be, you know, Oakland as the silver lining city. And I, I think that one good thing that has come out of this absolute tragedy is it has allowed us to kind of free or unleash the entrepreneurial bureaucrats. And they're, they're there. Uh, the city right. of Oakland is full of them. And right. this has been a moment that they really uh, have been allowed to shine. And the city council has absolutely supported uh, some real creative and quick thinking. You know, government is not famous for moving quickly or no. taking risks. <laughs> but this crisis, this pandemic has really given us some permission to do that. And uh, whether it's our Slow Streets program, where we just immediately identified 74 miles of streets uh, that could be closed to through traffic. Don't worry, your Amazon delivery is going to still get there, although you really should be ordering from Oaklandish or from the A's store. Right. Uh, but, you know, your, your deliveries can get there. You can still park, you know, your street, your, your whatever. Um, but those closing the streets off to through traffic and giving families and neighbors a space to spread out outdoors. And we know that being outdoors is a lot safer for you with this virus. Um, but to be able to walk, scooter, roller skate, Zumba, you know, six feet apart from your friends and neighbors, but at least see people uh, on those streets throughout the whole city. That's an example of silver lining thinking. Um, but we, we have some bigger things, and I want to commend the council recently made a big investment in standing up public Wi-Fi yeah. during the shelter in place and during uh, the shutdown of our schools and the shift to distance learning. The digital divide has become a bigger issue than ever. And again, I want to thank the Oakland A's. They were early contributors to our Oakland Undivided campaign that says that now is a moment that we can close the digital divide for good. 
not just lend students devices just to get them through this school year for distance learning, but to actually give them the devices, the, the permanent devices, not just for them, but also for their families, the internet connection and the technical support to make sure that that household is digitally connected to the whole real world because it is very isolating right now, particularly for our families. Absolutely. And it's not just schoolwork that kids need to be able to get through, through digital connection, but access to those free testing sites where they can pick up food, uh, information about how to apply for unemployment benefits. So much of that is online. And this is an opportunity for us to close it for good. So find out more about Oakland Undivided and thank you, Oakland A's, for being one of the first supporters of this effort. Absolutely, our pleasure. And, and there's so much more that we would like to do. And that's, that's actually why we have this platform, Mayor, so we can continue that dialogue of seeing how sports can play a pivotal role in finding what solutions are out there and how we can help amplify those solutions through our platforms. And let me just segue into that for a moment. You know, sports has been a very important part of Oakland's fabric and history, you know, the past half century, right? Going back to the Raiders, the Warriors, obviously, and us, the A's. And, you know, the other two teams are no longer in our city limits, but, you know, we, we still have love for them and their legacies of, of being Oakland's teams. But we're the town's team now, Mayor. <laughs> and we want to make sure that we stay the town's team forever. So what do you think the A's role is in our community, not only our pursuit of a new ballpark, but as it relates to issues such as these that we're talking about today, how can the A's and sports in general play a role in the healing process and in the educational process when we talk about race and inequalities and injustice? What can we do through our sports mechanisms and our teams, or, or our team, I should say, to continue to pave the road forward and, and be a trailblazer and partner with you? Well, you know, I touched on it earlier. Um, again, you are the place where we see ourselves as part of one diverse family. Uh, that's, that's what teams do for us. Um, you know, I, I love the work of John A. Powell and, and he talks about the underpinnings of racism, uh, not only being about, you know, oppression and power, but also being uh, about whether we other, we create others and then we have a sense of belonging ourselves. Yes. And sports creates that sense of belonging. Um, and again, you know, I think about growing up in Oakland and attending Skyline High School in the right. early 80s. Um, and, and the school, let's, let's just be honest, in the early 80s, the school was somewhat segregated. At, yes. at, at that time, it was roughly half white, half black, or, and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say 20% Latino and Asian, but, you know, mostly half black, half white. Sure. And sports and music and theater, that's where people came together. That's where you saw the friendships. Right. Uh, and, and that was a time when there still was a lot of overt racism. There was a lot of discomfort around um, the race, race power uh, movements, black power movements. That's when the Black Panthers were, were, were coming up. And, and you know, I, I will share a personal story I, I don't think I've, I've ever shared before. Um, a good friend of mine in, in high school was Ronnie Newton. Ronnie yeah. was the son of Huey Newton. And, and I'll be honest, when my dad found out that, you know, the head of the Black Panthers' son was hanging out at our house or with his da daughter, I, I got a pretty weird vibe from him. And that was certainly one of my wake up calls uh, to the existence of racism uh, in my community uh, and even right. in my family. Right. Uh, even you know, when I was a Girl Scout, uh, when I left Oakland, and it's, it's interesting when you, when you leave your city as a young child and you start to experience how other people view your city. And, and I will say a lot of people had never heard of Oakland until I mentioned it was the hometown of the A's and the Raiders and the Warriors, and then people had heard of it. So again, it, sports gives us a national identity. But I also got asked whether or not I was afraid living there. 
Mm. And, uh, you know, when, when Donald Trump repeatedly calls Oakland a dangerous city, uh, it is perpetuating uh, a, a absolute racist association with being a black city, with being a dangerous city. Right. And, and to have awareness of those types of messages that get put out all the time, that is the kind of thing we all need to fight against. And our sports figures, our heroes, are uniquely positioned to lead that conversation. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And I think the, the other part of the question is related to, in our economic recovery, looking at sports as a mechanism to, you know, once COVID does have a vaccine and we're able to safely resume life as we knew it to some extent, how do you envision our role, the A's, in supporting that economic recovery, whether that's, you know, our new ballpark endeavor or other things that we can do to ensure that we're bringing that economic boom back to our city? Because right now there's, there's just so much concern that will I, will I have a job when COVID you know, is over? Or if I have a job now, how long will I have that job, right? So things of that nature, how can we ensure that the A's and sports in general plays a role in our economic recovery? When I think of what an economic recovery looks like, I wanna be sure we're not going back to business as usual. Our economy is not equitable. Our economy um, preserves and supports the racial disparities that we have also seen in, in the infection rates in COVID, in incarceration rates, in, in just about every indicator of wellness, we see the insidious impacts of racism. And the economy is no different. So this is an opportunity for us to be far more mindful of what we come back to. And in my mind, there are three places where we have got to improve tremendously. And the A's have already shown, you know, demonstrated a commitment to all three of these issues. You know, first is education, ensuring that our children are getting the education that positions them for a successful family supporting career is critical. And uh, again, I want to thank you for being early supporters of the Oakland Promise, which is we, we, as Oaklanders, we should be proud that we have the nation's most comprehensive, literally cradle, like we're, we're starting with newborn babies, giving them college savings accounts right. to career. We're literally mentoring kids through that college experience. And it can be a four-year college, a two-year college, or a trade certificate. We are supporting all of those post-secondary paths to make sure people don't just go to, but through those experiences. Um, the second area is income, and that means good jobs. Uh, the A's have a great relationship with organized labor. You've always uh, been folks to pay a fair wage with benefits, so it's something that allows someone to actually be sustained, and you have a lot of jobs that allow people with varying education levels to actually take advantage of a living wage job. Yes. But I continue to believe that that needs to be supplemented by guaranteed basic income. And that is a policy uh, that I'm very passionate about. And then finally is wealth through ownership. To support intentionally Black and African-American owned businesses, businesses that are owned by our Native American and our communities of color, ownership of those businesses, success of those businesses is something that we have to do to end that wealth gap. Awesome. Uh, and, and that also includes home ownership, yes. uh, <laughs> affordable home ownership opportunities. Right. And those are all things that I know that the A's um, have been dedicated to and will continue to lean in on as we go forward. Thank you for that, that summary and those points. And you know, I, I wanna bring up a friend of ours Carl Chan from Chinatown. Carl, if you're watching, hey man, how you doing? Hope you're well. Carl has, has been an inspiration to me because of his efforts as an ambassador to Chinatown. And you know, Oakland has one of the, the most thriving Chinatowns in the world. When we think about it and its diversity and its, its businesses and the, 
the way it can thrive and it supports, you know, the entire zeitgeist of our community. What do you think we need to do in our black community to also see that same type of sustainability? And when we talk about communities of color, pre predominantly black and brown communities, there has been generation after generation of flight out of Oakland, right? Due to a number of issues, whether it be crime, whether it be unstable family settings, affordability, you name it, education or lack thereof. How do we do things differently, Mayor, coming out of COVID to protect families gener generationally? And as you answer and think about the question, there's a book, I don't know if you've read, it's called American Babylon. And American Babylon talks specifically about the systemic racism over the last 75 years, right? From when many black families came to California from the deep South and migrated here and what took place after World War II all the way up until you know, modern times, if you will. And you can see a trend of redlining, which made it very difficult for black families to purchase homes. They were essentially unable to move out of certain neighborhoods, right? There was a, a systemic effort to strategically disassociate wealth, wealth building in black communities from, from many decades ago. And now it seems that it's even harder for those who are interested in becoming a homeowner, et cetera, the, the ways to do that successfully given the challenges of today. So I know that's a mouthful of question, but give us your best thoughts on looking at the historic wrongs and how we can use today's policies and your leadership and others to think around how we can course correct from where we are today. So you're talking about structural racism. The fact that racism is baked into our institutions in our policies and our practices. I think it must start with a repeal of Prop 209, which I am so excited that the legislature just put that on our November ballot. Yes. We actually have two big opportunities this, well, I should say three, let's talk about the president, um, but I'll try not to get too political on your podcast, although that is the risk you take when you invite a politician on. It's okay. Um, <laughs> in California, we have Prop 15, it's also called Schools and Communities First, that would close a loophole that has allowed our biggest corporations to not pay their fair share of property taxes that the rest of us residents pay. And that will help course correct the investment in government that, that is part of evening this playing field. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to repeal Prop 209 to pretend that we cannot um, take race into account as we do our governmental work. When previous governments took race into account to absolutely intentionally discriminate against people of color, to prevent their accumulation of wealth through ownership of businesses, of homes, uh, that has, is intentional and we will not be able to undo it unless we are intentional about it. And I cannot tell you how excited I am about the work of Oakland's Department of Race and Equity. I, I don't know of another city that actually has a dedicated department yes. to race and equity. But this dismantling of the structural racism that is embedded even in this great progressive city like Oakland, and, and a great example of a way we did that recently was recognizing that the war on drugs was really racially motivated. Even in a city like Oakland, when you, when you look at who was actually arrested for, for example, marijuana charges, every study shows that marijuana is used by a, a perfectly good representative sampling of every race, every age, every gender. Right. But the arrests were almost exclusively black and brown men and boys. 
And so when we legalized cannabis in the, in the state of California, Oakland created a program to give absolute preference to that group that had been intentionally harmed by the previous legal structure. And so Oakland's equ equity program for cannabis um, is trying to put uh, those individuals or people who live in parts of the cities that were over-policed by the war on drugs, they get uh, to be first in line for this new industry. That's an example of how we can use data and real hard facts to undo the racism that was done. Um, coming up next in Oakland, and this will be controversial, I believe we need to do away with single family home zoning. Mm -hmm. That zoning law was used to replace what was uh, originally racially exclusive covenants in neighborhoods, the redlining that was done very intentionally. Zoning was kind of a replacement for that. We need to undo that both to address uh, the segregation, the prevention of wealth and ownership by people of color uh, through home ownership, as well as just to address our housing crisis. That's amazing. Now, thank you. You, you touched on many, many sensitive topics there that those of us who can recall how Oakland has changed over the last 30 or 40 years can truly attest to. And as I think back, Mayor, to your comments on redlining and how homes were deeded back in the day and these historical injustices that were done, today it seems like we have a different issue. However, its lineage is, is closely related to that. So what I mean is now we had, we have an issue of those who are here can't afford to be here, but those who used to be here that fled Oakland at a particular time want to come back. And there is this issue of affordability. So if I'm a current Oakland resident and I'm not a property owner, I'm a renter, and I'm looking for ways to buy a home, right? I have a family or I'm a single adult, what are some tools that you are aware of or could share with our viewers to give people more insight as to different programs and ways that we can retain our residents, especially our residents of color that are sometimes forced to move out into cities like Pittsburgh or Antioch, Fairfield, et cetera. We have a, a, a number of, of people in our community that call Oakland home, but don't live in Oakland anymore. Right. Or, or have a two hour commute one way to get into work, things of that nature. We, we hear so, so often about, and I'm, I'm just curious how you think those who are impacted can look for different solutions. Um, well, let me shout out a couple things. First, a great resource is housing assistance at oaklandca.gov housing assistance at oaklandca.gov. And that's where you could find out about protected affordable units, how to get in line for that. And Oakland, again, the Oakland City Council passed a policy to give preference to Oakland residents or people who were displaced out of Oakland for those very valuable protected affordable units. And just today we announced we received $90 million to help build 464 brand new units of this kind of protected affordable housing uh, at the Fruitvale BART station, at the West Oakland BART station, and out uh, on the BRT route at 105th and International. So three great projects, uh, and that's a way you can find out how to get in line uh, for one of those great units. And it's also a place where you can find out what your rights are as a tenant, especially during COVID, Oaklanders have extraordinary rights, uh, particularly due to our eviction moratorium. So again, we're here to help you secure affordable housing and also uh, protect your rights if you are a tenant. Um, those are the kinds of, those preferences, recognizing that someone who was displaced out of Oakland should have a leg up on getting um, these new affordable units. That's the kind of of policies that we're talking about. Yes. And I just wanna be clear, I believe we need to go through a truth and reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. We need to explore reparations. And that should not be something uh, that I lead that discussion in my place of, of privilege, but that needs to be defined by the impacted communities themselves. Uh, yes, we all, how do we yeah. do that? Like well, I think that we've got some pending legislation at the state level that I think is, is again, finally the political will is there. Obviously our wonderful Congresswoman Barbara Lee has been a leading voice at the federal level around that. So I think you're going to see more of that. And we, we're looking at a way to do it um, at a city level that hopefully will also be impactful. Um, but we all benefit when we do away with racism and especially structural racism that is denying all of us the full talent and brilliance and contributions of every member of our community. We all benefit from this work. Now, Mayor, where is that 90 million that you referenced a moment ago? Where is that coming from? The, that came from the state of California. A lot of it came from cap and trade um, money uh, because it recognizes that because these three projects are on public transportation, uh, that they actually will contribute to a reduction in greenhouse gases. Amazing. Well, that's positive. I mean, we, we need to know where more resources like that can be found because- You know, one other piece of good news, <laughs> as long as we're talking good news, yes. we also just got $28.2 million from the state of California for East Oakland. And you were talking about Carl Chan. You know, I car call Carl the mayor of Chinatown. <laughs> you know, I, I respect him as a, as a fellow mayor. Um, in East Oakland, there is an incredible community-led effort to really lay claim to the Black culture zone, to, to really make East Oakland about Black culture. And I want to recognize that organization, the leadership of Carol Johnson, who's leading it out. out. Uh, and that $28 million is going to help put in huge amounts of uh, street trees to really try and green East Oakland, to put some community-led gardens, to create um, sustainable, healthy produce in East Oakland. It has affordable housing. It's looking at transportation, especially bike transportation with our fabulous scraper bike team. So those community-led initiatives in East Oakland have been driven by that community and are also about preserving Black culture in East Oakland. Well, that's, that's amazing to hear. And I'm, I'm going to talk to what well, we've been actually talking to council members Taylor and Reed ongoing about East Oakland and obviously the A's being tenants at the Coliseum and, and hopefully property owners there with partnership with the city and the county, we can help to transform what East Oakland looks like in the future because that is a goal of ours as well that we share with you. Let's segue to a couple other hot topics before, before I let you off the hook with our interview. You've done great, Mayor. Thank you for your time today. You mentioned reform in a lot of areas, but one area we haven't touched on is police reform. And that is a very sensitive area for our constituency here in Oakland due to obviously the history we've talked about in all these different areas and mentioning how Oakland shifted, you know, during the early eighties when there was another pandemic of cocaine and crack and drug infestation primarily in black and brown communities. Yet again, there has been just historic wrongs that have been done in those areas throughout our community. And now we have this, this new campaign of racial tension and mistrust of our law enforcement officials across the country, across the world. And right here at home, we aren't immune to that. Obviously, we had a significant number of protests recently, and the community was very vocal in behaviors that we don't condone. We don't want to tear up our city, but we do want people to express themselves, right? So how do you respond, Mayor, to the efforts during the protest that the city, the administration, the police took, as well as what reforms you recommend from your, your desk and also with the council 
moving forward to right some of these wrongs of the past and of the present? Listen, I celebrate and support the protests, the righteous anger and rage over the lack of justice in our country. And policing has absolutely met a crossroads. I, um, you know, I had a great conversation just two days ago with, uh, with the Kings, uh, young African-American boys uh, through the Office of Equity at Oakland Unified School District, uh, the African-American Male Achievement Program Chris within Chapman. that department. Chris yeah. Chapman, Baba yeah. Chris, um, what a what a gift to Oakland! Not but just to yes. just to hear um, just to hear these young men talk about their absolute fear when they leave their homes that they don't know whether they'll they'll come back because they are afraid of being killed by those who those of us with privilege right. uh, see as our protectors. That are people that are here to protect and serve. Protect and serve who? And, and it, it really was um, just poignant to hear and, and all the evidence that they've seen that supports that fear. Uh, it, it is a fair question to ask whether or not that um, trust can ever be restored or frankly created. Because uh, I think it's fair to say that in many communities, especially Black and African American and Latinx communities, that trust hasn't been there ever. Right. And, and we can talk about the, the origins of police, um, but we, we also want to recognize, and it's important we do, that many people in Oakland have been helped by police. Mm -hmm. uh, police respond to people in their most traumatic moments, their moments where they need help, People have found a sense of justice and resolution when crimes are solved. That is also uh, a reality and a lived experience that we also must honor. Absolutely. And so I, I really, um, you know, as mayor, I don't think there are, is any issue I have dealt with that is more polarizing than right. the issue of police. Right. But I do think there are some things we can all agree on. One, I think we all want to get to a place of reimagined public safety, where the need for government response that is armed uh, is, is no longer necessary. That, that is a place we all want to get to. I think we can also agree that we have given police responsibilities and, and things to respond to that really are not appropriate for a law enforcement response. Right. People right. need Part care. They need right. trauma-informed, community-based and, and grounded, culturally competent care. Uh, when they call 911, that is a lot of the time what they want. So we in Oakland are very excited about standing up an entirely different response system. That's not the firefighters, not the police, but community-driven caretakers that, that are a mobile crisis response unit that is a third option when you call 911. So stay tuned. We actually started the process of creating this mobile response unit a year ago before all these protests. So I, I like to say Oakland was made for this moment. We also have to accelerate police reforms. And one of the things that excites me is there is an appetite at the state and federal level to do away with with some of the blockages that cities have had, like the Police Officers' Bill of Rights, like qualified immunity. Um, right. These changes are going to allow cities to hold their officers more accountable, ensure that we are getting the right people into this profession, and also to empower cities like Oakland that have very strong citizen police commissions. And that is unique about Oakland. We have the strongest and most independent citizen commission that sets the policies with regard to use of force, that has an independent investigation power that even plays a significant role, uh, one would argue a deciding role in firing and hiring the chief of police. 
Right. So these are some of the things that Oakland is, is doing and the context in which we sit as we both look to reform how we police, but also work to replace police where appropriate with better, more compassionate response. I respect that, Mayor. And I know you've had a lot of things to deal with in your tenure as mayor, and you have a couple of years left in this post. And I won't, I won't barrage you with a bunch of questions here, but I do think it's important for everyone to understand what are your top three priorities with the remaining time you have left in office? I mean, we've touched on a lot of different topics that are very important to the success of our community. But if you had to prioritize your time, which is very limited, and your administration's time, what are you most focused on <laughs> the next 24 months, if you will, give or take, to ensure that our city's in the best shape it can be when you move on to your next endeavor and the mayor to succeed you can build upon your success? Because I think what we don't want to see, Mayor, is when there is an eventual changing of the guard, that all of the work and efforts that you've made and mayors before you have made some way change or pivot in directions that are not advantageous to the community's sustainable safety and trust building and retention, if you will, of our residents. So what are, what are you gonna be focusing on with the administration and the city council in partnership that we can foresee over the next several months and a couple of years down the road? So, you know, it's true I have um, roughly two and a half years left as the mayor of Oakland, but my priorities have not changed. I have the same four priorities. Sorry, I'm gonna cheat and add one. I, have four, I started as mayor with four priorities. I still have those same four priorities and they are holistic community safety, obviously something that is more important now than ever and the conversation around it has changed. And just again, for me, um, holistic community safety is not just reforming the police, but it's things like the Oakland Promise you know, giving our young people the tools to succeed in life. That is holistic community safety. Uh, the second is uh, housing, economic, and cultural security. We have to provide Oaklanders those three things. And I talked earlier about how we're reimagining uh, wealth building through ownership of homes and businesses, mm -hmm. how we are looking at guaranteed income and fair wages as part of economic security. Uh, and, and you know, Oakland, culture matters to us. It's yeah. who we are, it's in our DNA, it's our secret sauce. Yeah. And cultural security is not just about the arts or food, it's also about this conversation about race. Do you have that sense of belonging here in Oakland? Do you feel safe and secure in expressing your full identity. That is so important to me and I think to all Oaklanders. Third is vibrant, sustainable infrastructure. And I'm excited, we, we literally just um, broke our record for the most miles of roads completely repaved in a single year. And most of them were in East Oakland because yes. you know Oakland's got some raggedy roads. And if we want to also take care of our planet, we have to think about the sustainability of that infrastructure. And then finally, a responsive, trustworthy government. So much of the protests in the streets right now are about not just um, a, a sense that government is not practicing justice or mm -hmm. equity or fairness, but also that the social contract is broken. Yes. And that has got to be fixed. Democracy matters. We have a presidential election coming up that is so consequential. Uh, it, it, it is frightening to me to think that we could stay with the leader we have right now. And right. that could happen if people don't believe that their participation matters. And mm -hmm. so those have been my priority since day one. They are still my priority. Frankly, I feel like we fail when we are not ambitious enough, nor recognize the interconnectivity 
of all of these issues. That's what Oakland deserves, is not just a particular project or initiative that is successful, but something that is real, that is comprehensive, that is transformative, and is built to last long after any particular politician is in office. So sustainability Absolutely. is part of that as well. I appreciate that response. And we have a few minutes left, so I wanna get a couple of closing thoughts from you to, in two parts. First part is lesson learned. What is the biggest lesson you feel, or if it's not just one, if you could give us an example of a lesson that you've learned as mayor as it relates to race, that you can use your remaining time in office to institutionalize new thought, new thinking around. And I think you've mentioned some of those things that you're gonna do with policy, but using your platform, what are some of the lessons you've learned in the past as mayor that you can carry forward in the future by bringing a solution or by changing the way you think or the way you lead to, in to incorporate this racial lens as a priority moving forward so that our constituency can feel like their mayor has their back and continues to have their back moving forward as we traverse through this difficulty as a country during this sensitive time. So give us a lesson you've learned and how you've taken that lesson forward to institutionalize change. You know, again, um, I feel blessed growing up in Oakland. You know, my best friend all my life um, is African-American, is Black. And so, you know, I, I feel like I've had more of an intimate view of the daily discrimination, the daily racism um, that she experiences that I don't. Uh, and so to see that the intentional behavior that people engage in is something uh, that I, I feel like I came into office aware of. Mm -hmm. But where I think people are really building a new awareness is of this much more subtle um, systemic racism, structural racism. I can tell you as someone who has worked for the Oakland city government for 21 years now, that yeah. this city government is full of people who care passionately about racial justice, who have the most golden hearts of public service that you could ever hope to find. And we are unconsciously, unknowingly, unintentionally perpetuating racist systems because that's how government was designed and government was designed to not change quickly. Right. And so to really step back and do that data analysis to unveil how these systems that don't appear on the surface to be racial at all mm -hmm. actually are. Things like I said, like single family home zoning, right. how, how that ties to actually a racist system. And, and you see it when you look at the actual disparities. And it's time that government cannot just get away with good intentions or the fact that our policies don't appear to be racially biased. Right. Hold us accountable for the results. When you look at the measures of, of just about every metric for well being, whether it's in health or economic security or housing security, you see tremendous disparities based on race. And none is bigger than in the criminal justice system. Yes. That, that has to be addressed first and foremost. And so to recognize that, to hold government accountable for having systems that don't continue to perpetuate those disparities, the outcomes, that is key. And then the other piece is for us to all recognize the, the implicit or subconscious bias that mm -hmm. we carry. I mentioned, you know, when I went on this Girl Scout trip as a young girl, having someone ask me, was I afraid living in Oakland? And um, I have really uh, enjoyed working with Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt of Stanford. Uh, she has an amazing book out called Bias. And she really talks about 
this subconscious association, particularly with black and brown men and boys and criminality and how that impacts everyone. But the hopeful news is how we can undo it, how we can correct for it. Yeah. So I think that is something I've really learned is the importance of that subconscious bias mm -hmm. and the structural racism uh, and how that uh, is where I think we could get some of our biggest wins, which is a different conversation than intentionally racist um, actions, uh, which, which is something that we get from uh, the President of the United States every day um, in his words, in his actions, in his tweets. Um, so that obviously has to be addressed as well. But I think that's our, our big challenge in government, the structural racism. And thank you for acknowledging that, Mayor. You know, there are a lot of people in our country who are afraid, afraid of what can happen if this administration at the federal level continues to be in control. And we want to stress the importance to our viewers of their power to vote and to use their voices as much as possible so we can look to a brighter future, you know. And one thing I want to mention as a closing thought for you is for our for our viewers, what can everyone watching do to not only support the efforts that you're leading, but to really make Oakland an anti racist community. You know, we have a lot of, I would call them closet racists, people that perpetuate a smile, but behind closed doors, they have different views, or they don't really like to be around people that don't look like them. And I read, I read a report many years ago that suggested that Oakland had, at one point, the highest concentration of the KKK in this particular area. Yes, from years past, that were members of that organization, but you don't know who they are. So how do we make sure publicly that our community continues to embrace anti-racism policies and procedures so that our community as a whole feels safe, welcoming as it perceives to be, because Oakland is one of the most diverse cities in the world. But how do we protect that and make sure that we're all doing our part to keep that, that anti-racism a part of our zeitgeist and a part of who we are as a community in our DNA? You know, I think that we have a moment right now to ensure every day we spend a little bit of time educating ourselves, whether it's watching TED Talks, uh, watching movies. Um, gosh, I just watched uh, Just Mercy about Brian Stevenson. Oh, okay. uh, if you haven't watched it recently, rewatch 13th. Um, you know, there is just some really good information. Um, if you're a book reader, read Color of Law, talks about the role of systemic racism in our current land use policies today. Uh, these are always, Evicted is another great book. It reads like a novel, but it's all actually factual about how evictions are, are almost like the, the Matt, what mass incarceration is for black men, the eviction laws are for black women and mothers. Uh, so these are all ways just to dedicate ourselves every day to educate ourselves more. And then get involved. Um, you know, it, it's hard. We don't have as much local coverage. So podcasts like yours are super important. But there are a lot of ways, you know, to watch the city council meetings, watch the police commission meetings in Oakland. Um, I've got this town hall series on uh, Thursday nights, uh, great speakers. We take live questions through social media. It's very interactive. Yes. Uh, and then there are tons of boards and commissions, nonprofits that you could get involved with. You know, find something to do in your free time that is making um, a more just and equitable city where everyone thrives. So education, activism, and then finally, advocacy. And that's, that's where um, Oakland has been great, uh, but don't just show up to support or be against, help create these new laws, help create these new policies. You know, you asked me about lessons that I've learned. 
leadership is not about a formal title or authority. Mm -hmm. Leadership is what you take upon yourself. When we think about the greatest leaders that our nation has ever seen, you know, people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi, they never had a governmental title. Right. They never had formal authority, and yet they changed the world. Exactly. So don't wait. You have this power in you um, to, to create this new uh, future, particularly our young people. We are really counting on you. And uh, every conversation I have with young people gives me tremendous hope and optimism about moving towards a truly just and equitable future, not just for Oakland. I think it will start in Oakland, but mm -hmm. then, you know, we can save the world starting in Oakland. You know, Mayor, I could talk to you all day because there are so many things, so many important things that you're helping us lead. And I know you have to get back to running our city, <laughs> so I'll let you do that. But I just wanted to ask one, one personal question, if you feel comfortable answering it, is what's next for you? after your your mayoral terms conclude have you begun thinking about how you are going to continue to lead whether that's in another office or you know in the private sector i'm sure those thoughts have come to your mind if 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 at all could you share what what types of things you're passionate about you know outside of being this this servant of our community well uh you know just the first thing honestly that comes to mind is sleep i'd like to get some sleep <laughs> <laughs> being the mayor. Um, no, seriously, I, I, you know, I'm not one of those people that grew up dreaming of being in office or, or even leading my hometown. Um, I love my city. I love what it stands for. And I believe that I can um, pursue my passions and my values through so many different ways. Um, so I, I don't have a single thing in mind. Um, I could stay in elective office or, or trust me, I could definitely live the rest of my life without holding another elective office. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, I really don't have uh, any specific plans, but I know that following my passion and letting my values guide me has served me well. And uh, I encourage any young people that are out there, don't think about what the job title is that you want. Don't think about who you wanna be. Think about what you wanna do. Sure. I wanna make the world a better place, starting in Oakland with Oakland values. So whatever it is I do next, that's what it will be about doing. Awesome, Mayor. Well, we appreciate that. So thank you so much for your time today. And for anyone watching, including yourself, we would want we want you to also know that we have a website dedicated to this conversation and all the things that the A's organization is a part of. It's called athletics.com slash BLM for Black Lives Matter. And this interview, as well as all the others that we've done to date, are listed there. And we'd love for you and all your constituents to have an opportunity to see who we've been interviewing thus far. We've had a great, great cast of people and we thank you for for being our most recent guest and barbara lee's coming on next she'll be on very soon so please uh let her know if you talk to her in advance that it's not that bad it's not that bad we're not gonna <laughs> put them in that seat too long well it's always a pleasure hanging out with you taj thank you to the oakland a's for truly being rooted in oakland and being rooted in oakland means talking about race taking on racism, especially black racism, taking on white supremacy. So thank you for living up to those Oakland values and continuing this conversation and not just being about talk, but also about action. There we go. Thank you so much, Mayor. All the best. All right. Take care.